Hi. Uh, I'm Alan Hoffman from the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Uh, I'm one of those feds who apparently controls the water supply of the United States. And uh, if I have to leave suddenly, it's because we have a, an emergency on the water supply. Uh, I wish I had known that in advance, but okay. I guess Mike has the other part, Mike O'Neill. Huh? We'll talk, we'll talk later. You know, I'll give you a share of that. Um, this is panel one, entitled Knowledge Gaps in Research and Education. Now, in his uh, welcoming, in his keynote address, David did address the issue of education, which is a very, very critical need. Um, I can speak of that from the point of view of energy. I'm, I'm an energy guy. I'm a renewable energy guy who got into water at the end of the uh, previous, uh, at the end of the Clinton administration because water is a very important part of the peace process in the Middle East. And um, my knowledge of renewable energy was part of the motivation for sending me over to uh, Jordan. Uh, and I got hooked on the importance of the issue. So that's why I'm standing in front of you today. And I've been doing a lot of water and water energy stuff ever since. Um, water is going to become a much more important part of the U.S. government's activities in the future. It already is, and there are lots of agencies and departments that address water issues. Right now, officially, there is no department or agency that addresses water at the, the nexus between water and energy. And there is some legislation that is trying to change that, but we'll, we'll see what happens with the Congress. In addition, I just want to mention that with the realization that adaptation to climate change is going to be a very critical need, that we're beyond just thinking that we can mitigate it, but we really have to adapt to it. Um, there's been a lot of interagency work uh, on how the U.S. government should address these issues, and a report on, as a first step has gone to the president on October 5th. Uh, which basically, which is available, by the way, publicly, and uh, basically says that each department and agency in the federal government has to figure out how to address these issues. That's a very important first step. Our panel this morning is going to address the educational needs. How do we educate not only the public, but the decision makers, both here and around the world, because this is a global issue, although it has many, many direct implications for the United States. And then the whole question of research. We have to do a lot of research if we're going to deal with these issues properly. Uh, just to give you one example, um, we really don't know how global climate change is going to change precipitation patterns. Our infrastructure is based on historical patterns. That's the old stationarity concept that you, know, you could look at the last 50 years and project what the next 50 years will be. Well, the reality is that the, the past 50 years are not going to really be a very good guide to the next 50 years, the non-stationarity requirement. And so we're trying to figure out, as best we know how, and somewhat desperately, how the precipitation patterns and the water patterns are going to change. So we have a lot of research to do in that area, just on global climate change, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that uh, my department gets into where do you provide the water as needed to provide the energy that people will need? And energy and water are the basic elements of a sustainable society. You need both, and the reality is you cannot separate energy and water issues at all. Uh, people tried for the longest time because they didn't want to think about putting them together. Uh, but when you stop to think about it, energy and water issues are inseparable. And that realization has sort of gained public credence only in the last couple of years. It shouldn't have taken that long, but that's the reality. And now people are talking about the nexus, and they're also talking about doing water and energy activities together. And so there's a whole bunch of research needs that need to be identified. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel this morning to address the issues of research needs and educational needs. I'm not going to do more than uh, give you their names and, and titles. Their bios are in the materials that were handed out to you. We have Pete Klopp, who's a senior fellow with World Resources Institute. We have David Reed from World Wildlife, uh, World Wildlife Foundation. 
and Ed Link from the University of Maryland, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. I'm going to ask each of the speakers to take no more than 15 minutes to address these issues as they see them, and then we will open it up for questions to the audience. Pete, you want to go first? Yep. Good morning, and uh, thank you for, um, for being here and listening to me for 15 minutes. Um, my name is Piet Klopp. I'm from the Netherlands, so pardon the accent. Um, I started off in water engineering, moved on to water economics, and now I start to try to get my mind around water and finance. And there's a logic to it, even though it all hap just happened. It was never by design. David certainly opened up a whole can of worms there for us this morning. And um, I'm going to take it no down a notch, I'm afraid. Um, I think, in essence, what he was saying is that, you know, we should go all out in trying to get the prices right, pricing in externalities. Well, that's a lot easier said than done, obviously. And I'm going to hopefully talk meaningfully about what we can do in the meantime, because getting those prices right is easier said than done. It won't happen for a while. I'm also trying to stay... St stick to the script, though, and, and trying to address the questions that we got beforehand from the moderator of the panel, uh, thinking about um, knowledge gaps. I don't know why my slide only you know, has the edges cut off, which is unfortunate, but um, I took great pains in putting our motto, at least, on the facade of the Lincoln Memorial. <laughs> and this is my particular take on knowledge gaps here, that, you know, what we try to do that's the finance part of my background and the work I'm currently doing, is educate the investment community, the private investment community about water. And I think it's fair to say that they are lagging, uh, most of you, in their understanding and appreciation of where and how this has the potential to bite them in the ass. Also, by the way, I'm going to say one more thing about David. You know, I admire his ability to write a book in Amsterdam <laughs> and not succumb to the temptations of the place <laughs> and keep on the straight and narrow thinking about water. Excellent. Here's another man who is trying to keep on the straight and narrow. Um, this is Governor Purdue in Georgia in a prayer breakfast for water. When two years ago Georgia was in this terrible drought that had Atlanta in just two months from you know, absolute drought, that's not just shortage, that's acute drought, uh, they were gathering on the uh, steps of the state capitol, praying for rain. Now, sure enough, two months later, it started raining. <laughs> and you know, that's certainly one way to go about uh, water management. And who knows, maybe there's people in Georgia that think that this is the way to go about it, and you don't need actual knowledge then either. You know, you just need more belief. But I'm trying to say that there is a perception gap there. There's people at high levels of government that just don't quite see the urgency and the importance of meaningful water resources management the way we do. In the investment community, there's another gap. It's the incentive gap, and maybe David alluded to this already. Um, you know, the, the horizontal bar there is how we're all going to hell in a handbasket. The green line tells us how interest in that process is going to develop in the financial markets. And I've got an anecdote to illustrate this. It's the Klopp curve. You know, I thought if I can't fix all the world's problems, at least I want my own curve. <laughs> <laughs> and you can use it at your heart's desire, because, you know, we don't actually protect our property rights. It's all in the public domain. So um, I was at Goldman, and, you know, I was projecting all these water... Um, problems. And then the guy says, okay, you're telling me there's a crisis coming up in 2025. So I nodded, you know, I thought, great, he got a point. Then he said, well, call me in 2024. And he walked right <laughs> out of the door. So, you know, that's the environment we're trying to preach the gospel in. You know, it, this, is, this is certainly not a done deal. There's very many people out there that don't think there's much of a problem at all. And if there's a problem, we'll solve it when we get there. 
There's also conceptual gaps, and again, David talked about this already. Is water the next oil? No, it's not, because its price doesn't reflect scarcity value. As a consequence, there's underinvestment and poor incentives to actually use the stuff efficiently. So it's not oil. Is it then carbon? No, it's also not carbon, because carbon is this perfect global commodity. But water is not, because it's unique, locally unique. It's got spatial, temporal, social, environmental attributes that carbon simply doesn't have. There's a what and where and how to water that carbon or CO2 emissions simply lacks. You know, it doesn't matter where you emit carbon, but it does matter a whole lot where you use or pollute water. There's data gaps for sure, and this is almost, you know, I don't know whether this works in English, but in Dutch you would say this is kicking in an open door. There's always going to be more data needed. But look what we do in, in water, you know. There's plenty of global databases that have water scarcity or other water-related statistics at the country level. And sure, at the country level, things get more dire with time. But they get really dire with more granularity. And this is the key point, that, you know, we got to go local if we are really going to get our minds around water risk, which is the key point that I hope you'll take away from, from my presentation here. There's another gap. There's a disclosure gap. Companies, at least some companies, disclose their water use and water pollution. But they do it in a way that hardly resonates with investors at all. They don't read these, gl these glossy sustainability reports that are full of beautiful, happy stories and numbers, but there's no context, so there's no way to compare or make sense of those numbers. There's, it's like the telephone book. There's many numbers, but there's just no meaning. So it's the meaning we try to add to this. And for more meaning, I think there's also going to be a shift required. And again, you see that little balloon in the top, top left, you know, that's the question that this slide is trying to address. But we've got to think differently, at least from a company investor angle about water. It's not just happy stories about impact on or less impact on the environment, being nice to the neighbors, doing good community stuff. All that is great, and we should definitely encourage companies to continue doing so. But for investors, that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for how is water going to impact that company, its operations, its supply chains, and perhaps its product markets. So it's not impact on, it's impact by. It's not the corporate social responsibility report, CSR in the top right. It's the 10K filing that matters. So if education and knowledge comes in here, it's trying to add more focus to our thinking about water and try to organize our data, our intelligence around this idea of water risk. And of course, you know, one man's risk is another man's opportunity. So they go hand in hand. But first we've got to understand these risks. I won't go through this, it's too much detail perhaps, and I can certainly distribute this presentation later on. But what it tries to say is that, you know, water has this potential to either affect your supply chain, your production process, or your product markets. And it can either be a physical risk, a regulatory risk, or a reputational risk. Depending the risk profile a particular company or sector has, it's one or the other is more or less important. And there's many companies that are already experiencing this. This is not just a hypothetical threat that, you know, organizations like the World Resources Institute love making up, you know, to, I don't know make our lives more complicated, I guess. No, it's not, it's a real problem. And therefore, real opportunities down the road. Now what we do is at least two different things. We do sector level, uh, level research. Um, and we take deep dives, you know, in specific issues, and it was mentioned already, you know, we look at water constraints on power generation in places like India. There's almost no limit to the amount of power it needs. There are certainly limits to the amount of water it has. And these are going to come to a head pretty soon, <coughs> if they're not doing this already, in fact. Whether or not this is translating into a material, a financially material water risk, is a different thing altogether. Water dependence, sure, is an important factor here. Water security is another important one. But 
whether or not as a stakeholder in a particular power plant you're going to lose money depends on the regulatory regime. And there's a lot we can fix there. Because right now, many of these power plants in India at least will return your money no matter what, even if they don't produce power thanks to water shortages, which is odd. You know, it kind of takes away any incentive you may have had in managing your operations carefully. So the result of this is that many of these plants are either existing or being planned in areas that are at risk of running out of water or at least are going to face increasingly, um, well, increasing competition for that scarce water. It's these kind of overlays, simple as they are, that are huge eye-openers for you know, that specific audience that we're targeting for knowledge, information, and intelligence. Then we also do, apart from the deep dives, the sector level research, we do also uh, tool development. There's many tools out there, and you may think you know, the last thing we need is another tool. Except that this is a great tool. <laughs> We call it aqueduct. Um, and you know, it, it, it may answer some part of the question that is, is raised in that, that balloon again. Um, it's important for experts to work together. It's important to um, integrate water and energy planning. But we all know that none of that is easy. It just won't happen because we want it to happen. I mean, several of us, of us have been around in the water space, at least, for, for decades. And we've been talking about integrated water resources management for a long, long time already. We've never really pulled it off because maybe it's too complicated. Now, I think that is partly, and the knowledge management around it is partly tricky because we've never quite found a way, a, a, a lever, a gearing to make this feed of itself. You know, there's plenty of models and they're scattered all over the world. There's just no way to connect them. There's plenty of research projects, but there's just no way to connect them. Now, we think that there may be ways to connect them that are slightly different than just framing and designing another interdisciplinary huge research effort. Um, we've been thinking about this with Goldman Sachs and GE, and it's called Aqueduct. It's really a database of local or localized water risk information with a couple of applications that are going to help companies to report on water risk, not just impact on the environment, but impact by the environment. There's applications about these simple overlays. There's applications that can uh, weigh the different indicators that we track <coughs> for the risk profile of a particular sector. There's all of that. I won't go into much detail because it will take too long. Just the basic idea is this, that we track these different indicators and we aggregate them. You can aggregate or disaggregate them in a tool online that we've built. We've done a prototype for the Yellow River in China looking at the power sector. So there's all these different risk drivers that you can either, uh, that you can group in either physical, cost or disruption risks. And you can aggregate them as I said, and we've done so for 132 different units geographic units within the Yellow River Basin. So the best way to think about it is a water risk atlas, but a pretty granular one. And you know, we believe that is the key. We've got to go local with our information and our knowledge. We also try with the help of Coca-Cola, which has done this internally for their own proprietary purposes. We've uh, thought about how, you, how do you keep a risk atlas, a risk database current? Well, they've done it internally and they call that the water risk collector. So there's a top-down water risk atlas that is being refreshed from the bottom up. Coca-Cola does that through its facilities. We'll do it through a kind of a wiki um, mechanism. Ultimately, that information, the context, combined with the footprint information on the right, <coughs> is going to help companies and their investors yep, um, think about water risk and report on water risk. And now here comes the clincher. I'll, I'll skip this, I'll, I'll move straight to this clincher, in fact. Um, Bloomberg is a partner of the World Resources Institute. And uh, it's interested in putting environmental risk information, including water risk information, on its platform. 
I think this is a great breakthrough. Not because all answers are going to be coming from the private sector, but because the private sector can act as a, as a force to actually get serious about reducing those water risks. We did an overlay of power plants in the southeast on top of water scarcity map. And here is what you can do with that. You can rank companies, power companies, by their relative exposure to these water shortages. This way, we believe you may have found a mechanism that acts as a pool for integrated data collection, as well as a push to investors to take this stuff on board and to really start, and companies, by the way, to really start thinking about what water risk can do to the portfolio or at the company level, what water risk can do to that, that ranking you find yourself in. So we believe that rather than thinking about more data, more knowledge management, more research projects, what we need to do is think about a mechanism that can keep that whole machinery or can grow that, that, that machinery, can integrate all these different efforts in a way that, at least for the private sector, for this particular audience, Bloomberg does. For us, this is the platform. One, one second, if you don't mind, Jenna. The question, of course, that we were asked by Bloomberg, and this goes back to the clock curve at the beginning, is, is there in fact a market demand for this stuff already? Well, I think the jury's still out. And that's because, you know, outside this room, there's a whole world that doesn't quite believe this is urgent. But there's interesting signs, though, that at least has, uh, have persuaded Bloomberg that it's worth investing in this, together with Gold and GE. There's research efforts, and recently Ceres came out with a publication on water risk and bond ratings that some of you may have seen. There's regula regulatory pressure, especially, of course, the SEC guidance from earlier this year. There's all these voluntary initiatives. The Carbon Disclosure Project will come out with a water disclosure project November 12th, its first results. <laughs> and there's all that emerging corporate evidence. All that adds up to a market demand for actionable information and by extension, hopefully, a corporate investor demand for more meaningful water policy, water management, including getting those prices right. But it'll be some time before we get there. <laughs> but this could be one way to bring that day nearer. Thank you. I think we'll hold the questions until all three speakers have made their remarks, and then we'll just open it up for broad discussion. Ed, do you want to come next? Uh, University of Maryland is going to give us uh, his views on uh, these issues. Good morning. In a recent issue of the National Geographic called Our Thirsty World, it uh, stated that we have 366 million trillion gallons of water just about exactly the same amount the dinosaurs had. Hopefully we don't meet the same end. 97% of that is salty. Of the rest of it, uh, almost 70% is in, locked up in snow and ice. 30% uh, is in groundwater, and only about 0.3% is available for, readily available for use. So we have a, at least a supply problem because we also are faced with a, a very dramatic increase in demand and typically, as has been stated, we have the demand in areas where we don't have the water. Uh, this makes for an interesting career for a lot of us that have been in water management. Uh, truth in lending, I spent 34 years in the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, all of it in the unreal world of research and development. Uh, so I, I do come from a federal background and, and I would like to, in, in, in one respect, uh, defend our honor in the sense that I think we've got the only chance, uh, not working for a profit, of, of trying to at least create a framework where the market system can work effectively. I agree wholeheartedly with the market system. Uh, but in the decade that I've been out of the government and, and working both with industry and academia, I haven't seen the market uh, work to perfection. I haven't seen industry uh, able to to walk away from the profit motive quite as much as as the 
that myself as a private citizen would like to see. So I think there's a need, certainly a big need for a change in the way industry and government and the private sector uh, work to solve these problems. Uh, but I think there's a big role to be played by the government agencies. We've got to figure out how to do that role. We're not doing it now. Uh, we're also faced with um, uh, lots of change uh, and change in a, in a situation where we have a uh, $375 billion worth of infrastructure um, nestled behind levees, uh, 100,000 miles of levees, most of which we don't even have mapped as to where they are, let alone what their condition is. Um, and and um, we're losing 60,000 acres of wetlands uh, each year. So uh, we have a lot of challenges. So what are the issues? Uh, what are the big issues in my perception? Uh, and a lot of my perceptions are going to be based on the last five years that I spent trying to figure out what went wrong in New Orleans uh, and, and some uh, uh, efforts in the Central Valley of California, which was brought up uh, earlier this morning, uh, and uh, what the Dutch are doing uh, to face climate change in the future. Uh, I think number one uh, biggest issue that we're faced with is a policy issue, not a knowledge, not a scientific knowledge issue. Uh, our policies have been developed in very narrow silos. Uh, they typically uh, do not address uh, multiple sectors like water and energy and agriculture or food uh, and environment. Uh, and, and I think uh, if there was one thing I could fix with my magic wand, if I were Harry Potter, it, it would be policy. Because I think that will drive changes in the way government uh, contributes. Uh, that, that can also drive uh, more of a, a market approach to dealing with some of these issues. But right now, I think policy is our biggest barrier. It's not adaptive. It's, it's still one size fits all in most cases. And it's way too uh, narrow and way too deep in most cases. The other major issue we face is change. Um, we've talked about climate change, but there's, you know, if you really take a holistic look at risk in the United States, the, the biggest contributor to increasing risk is not Mother Nature changing, it's, it's the population demographics. We're shoving more and more people into, into areas with no water. We're shoving more people into the coastlines of the United States. And so risk is increasing not because of the probability of a hazard. It's increasing because of the probability of loss. Uh, and, and that uh, has been demonstrated pretty uh, clearly, I think. Uh, but when we talk about our standards, uh, we have uh, the de facto 100-year floodplain standard in the United States compared to, say, the Dutch, uh, who are currently rocking in around 1 in 10,000 and are looking carefully at whether or not they should go to 1 in 1 million or 1 in 100,000 uh, as a criteria for flood protection. Uh, but what, what the public doesn't understand, and, and I think what many people don't understand, is just how uncertain uh, that 100-year flood line is. Uh, it's, it's, got an, it's got an order of magnitude of uncertainty. And yet, and so what have we done? The people, people believe that this is a, a, a solid line etched in, on Earth. And, uh, and if you're reading the papers now around the country, and especially in places like California and Louisiana, you're seeing a huge outcry because of the change in the flood maps, FEMA's, FEMA's new flood maps that have moved those lines, uh, and uh, the decertification of a lot of levees because of uh, new standards and new evaluations, much of which was learned from Katrina. Uh, so now we have this huge outcry of, whoa, wait a minute, you, you idiots in the federal government cannot change this line. You're, you're putting economic pressure on uh, the local developers, you're putting economic pressure on individuals who now are faced with either not being able to get flood insurance or they're faced with having to have flood insurance. Uh, so that's a huge issue. Well, why, uh, why are these things changing? Uh, 
it's, it's complex, as you might, as you already know. Uh, Hurricane Katrina, for example, if you looked at it 40 years ago, using the, the central hurricane central pressure deficit, the, the typical measure of intensity, it would have been about a thousand year meteorological event. In 1979, after uh, a few more severe events occurred to build up the historical database, uh, that exact same storm would have been a 285 year event. In 2005, when it struck New Orleans, Hurricane Katrina was a 100 year event. So which is right? Well, none of those are right. Uh, because uh, and new analysis shows that Katrina was actually about a 400-year event uh, based not just on central pressure, but based on the joint probability of other parameters that are important to uh, the generation of surge. So we have this, this um, metric, this metric of how often do these things occur flopping all over the place. Uh, that's part of our standard. That's part of our standard. $15 billion have just been spent, or will be spent as of next year in New Orleans, generating a, a system that will supposedly defend New Orleans against a 1% chance surge event. $15 billion. And we know that 1% surge event is not correct. We know that it's not correct. We know it's uncertain. I did the uncertainty analysis. Okay? It's an order of magnitude uncertain. Now, what do you do about that? What do you do about that? Well, you better understand the uncertainty. Better understand the uncertainty. And you better factor that uncertainty into any design or any action that you take. So the Corps did that, in fact. Bless their heart. The Corps used the 90th percentile surge data to set the elevations for this new system instead of the most likely uh, value, which is the 50th percentile, if you're into probabilities. Uh, and that's a very, that's a very conservative call. But without that, uh, New Orleans would be much more at risk than even it will be after next year. So a lot of change to worry about. In California, the, the, uh, the reservoirs in the Sierras that drain into the rivers that flood the Central Valley of California that we talked about, uh, are having 100-year floods just about every uh, four to five years, 100-year floods based on historical record. Uh, recent projections show that the 100-year the inflow to most of those reservoirs is up about 50 percent uh, of what it was when the reservoirs were designed. So there's a change in the whole water regime in California in the Sierras uh, that negates the analysis and the design of all of that infrastructure uh, that is uh, supposed to be allowing that water to be managed. Uh, managed not just for floods, also managed for environmental purposes and water supply and, and so forth. So that change presents a huge challenge. And then we've got sea level rise. Uh, sea level rise is about one to three millimeters per year in New England. It's about three to five millimeters per year right now in, in the mid-Atlantic along here. It's five to 10 millimeters per year in New Orleans, mostly because that whole area is sinking faster than sea level is going up. If you go to Alaska and Puerto Rico, it's actually sea levels coming down. In Alaska, it's more than five millimeters per year of sea level going down. So it, it's a high, it's very variable. But it is an issue that, well, a creeping, oozing kind of a hazard that we've got to deal with environmentally and uh, by infrastructure and, and so on. Uh, and it's not easy to deal with when the political climate is dealing with the election cycle and the, uh, uh, the, the water issue in this case is a life cycle issue, which is a much different time frame. Uh, so you might say, how sensitive are we to climate change? How sensitive are we to things like sea level rise and more intense storms? Uh, I think that's an area where we need a lot more research. Uh, but it's not research in projecting how uh, big the storms are going to get in the future, the perfect storm movie, so to speak. It's research on understanding what our sensitivities are. Uh, for example, in New Orleans, we, we doubled the, we, we created a 152 hurricane future climatology to look at risk 
uh, for the future of New Orleans. Uh, that included storms from about 50-year type events to 10,000-year type events. Uh, so we doubled it. We said, what would happen if we doubled this? What if it got twice as bad, uh, which even the most ardent uh, climate change uh, extremist would say, yeah, that's a pretty tough test. And what we found was that the increase in surge levels and wave conditions at the 500-year frequency level was about 10%. It's not a 100% problem. It's a 10% problem. Okay, that's an extremely important piece of information. That bounds uh, the decision framework for what you might do about that. And we need a lot more analysis like that that's, that's based on models and analysis that is, that is technically credible and has the resolution. I, I love the map of the, the resolution of the water problems going from a, a national basis to a regional basis to a watershed basis because it, that granularity is what is critical in, in, a, in a, an analysis like this. The other big challenge we have, uh, was talked about uh, earlier, uh, is valuing things. Uh, what do we value right now? And when we look at, uh, we value flood damages. We, uh, we, we typically value the direct damages. Uh, in New Orleans, Katrina created $20 billion in direct property damage. But the real damage was social, cultural losses, environmental losses, and indirect economic losses. The indirect economic losses alone turned out to be $200 billion. Uh, the social cultural losses, eight, only eight of 73 neighborhoods in the entire region uh, were not flooded. And most of those neighborhoods that were flooded, all of the social services are gone. Uh, why would you move your family back there? The real difficulty in recovery in New Orleans was not rebuilding homes. It was rebuilding neighborhoods. And we have no practice for rebuilding neighborhoods. A uh, huge issue. And yet, when we compute risk, when we analyze consequences, uh, and I don't care whether it's from a flood or from a drought or, or from uh, some other action we're going to do to affect the water regime, uh, we're stuck right now with some fairly simplistic, uh, direct uh, computations and, and metrics. One of the big issues we face in, in all of this is communication. Uh, we communicated risk in New Orleans by printing maps showing the probability of flooding to different depths uh, for the entire region. And we found, and, and we, we did this to inform the local uh, governmental officials who had to make decisions. But the, the real use came by, by providing them to the public. And we found these maps tacked on doors next to real estate signs that said with an X, here I am, I'm not in a high flood risk zone, buy my house. I mean, these, this was something we hadn't even thought about. But power to the public. When the public had the same information as the local government officials, they began to get action that was action related to the systematic uh, information, understanding the holistic risk scenario for New Orleans. And it was only after the public had that information that, that those types of decisions started to get made. Uh, we have a big problem, I think, when talking about policy, of, of having policy informed by science. Uh, it's very difficult to get policy people in a room with scientists and scientists in a room with policy people. Uh, and better yet, try to get some practitioners in the middle. Uh, I think this is, this is a symptom that we've got to fix. Uh, it's a vertical integration problem similar to the vertical integration problem between the federal authorities, state authorities, and local authorities. Uh, I bring up one case, land use. Uh, local authorities have all the, the uh, local governments have all the authority for land use. Federal government has no authority for land use. So why do we end up, uh, for example, in the... Uh, uh, area that was flooded in 1993 by the, the Upper Miss floods, we now have 28,000 new homes, a 23% increase in population, and 6,600 acres of industrial development in the areas that were flooded. 
and the levees are no better than they were prior to the 1993 flood. What's going on? That's a local government decision. That's local governments focusing on development. Natomas County in California, exactly the same thing. Levees were decertified. Uh, the local uh, uh, federal uh, congressional representatives were able to, to create a delay in the time of the, the effective date of the decertification of the levees and gave all the developers a month to run to the courthouse and file petitions for new developments prior to the, the decertification. That's a local decision, not a federal decision. So turning everything over to the local governments to manage water is a great idea, and I'm all for moving it down away from the feds, but not until the local governments have a reward system that's different from the one that they're reacting to now. Uh, in the educational, one word on education, since I'm an educator now, um, Maryland has been trying very hard to, to create cross-cutting programs. We have a new program on en between engineering and public policy. Uh, we're, we, we're now giving master's and PhD degrees in that area. Very fruitful, uh, very, very positive development. Maryland's also created a, a series of undergraduate courses called I-courses that are looking at integrative topics and, and innovative topics to expose freshmen and sophomores to this concept of you can't just be a specialist in one area. You've got to understand the entire domain that you're working in. But you try to get research funded in an area that's a cross-cutting area. Everyone talks big about it. But I have submitted a lot of proposals to the, the typical funding agencies. Nobody wants to fund it. But you go in with a deep, uh, discipline-oriented proposal, and your chances for funding are much higher. So we've got to walk our talk. Thank you. David Reed will now talk to us um, from the perspective of WWF and the, uh, his office uh, in policy. Good morning, all. Uh, great pleasure to be with you today. I will confess that Pete Klopp and I uh, conspired in our preparatory thoughts to um, disagree on everything, even our assumptions we wanted to uh, uh, have controversy on. And I'm very disappointed, Pete, to let you know that I embrace a great deal of what you said. And even worse, I find myself uh, in, in largely in agreement with what, with what Ed has had to say to you today. So I'm, I'm looking for controversy and provocation. I'm not sure I'm going to do that to start off. But what I would like to do is I want to address three points uh, today. The first is to identify the new context in which we have to organize and develop knowledge about water management, new context. Second, discuss some of the limitations of our current knowledge and how that knowledge, above all, is presented to policymakers. And third, end with a few recommendations that I'm glad to say are going to coincide very much with the President's task force on adaptation that have uh, recently come out that Alan alluded to. Um, first, the context, quite simple. Um, the context is framed by climate change. I will differ a little bit with, with what Ed had to say here, um, in which our question of water management is fundamental, I'll say fundamental, to our policies to our institutions and the incentives that we need in place. Just very briefly, climate change will be detrimental to virtually all freshwater ecosystems by 2020. Most freshwater ecosystems will be profoundly transformed by mid-century, and human enterprise will be profoundly affected through water supply, fisheries, so, uh, sanitation, agriculture, and many other sectors. New context, that's point one. I could go in much greater detail, uh, but I think that should suffice for the moment. The second point, then, is just to offer a few observations on how knowledge and information is organized and presented at the present time. And here are two factors that I think we're really up, two issues we're really up against um, as we try to embrace this concept of knowledge management on water in the context, this new context of climate change. The first is that the knowledge gap that's alluded to um, in the introduction by, by CSIS, in fact, is created, I think, by the limited information 
and also how we package information for policymakers. A simple example, it's a well-known example. It's, it's uh, Colorado, it's 1922, the Compact of 1922. And basically what you have is a decision that was made about water management allocation, storage, that was based on data collected in 19-teens that was actually, the, there was a greater abundance of water than at almost any period in recorded history. And in fact, that of great abundance, particularly on the eastern slope of Colorado, was attributable to changes in ocean currents and upwellings, in ocean upwellings at that time. So we used that data to construct that compact that led to an urbanization and a developmental process that is very much with us today. In addition to which, so that is the information, the faulty information, but coupled with that is that decision making was basically at that point um, made on the question of who is there first. First in time, that's to say who got there first, was actually had the first in right. And so that became much of the legal foundation for allocation in this context of faulty information. So it's true that that policy still prevails to a large extent today. We're trying to, trying to modify it, but it, we have created a series of patterns about knowledge that remain with us very much today. Um, and you'll say, well, really, that, that uh, we ha we're, we're more informed, we're better at making decisions today. Let me give another example. Um, the World Bank is actually developing its energy policy at the present time, very controversial. And it is soon to be submitted to the executive board. Now, this energy policy comes right on the heels of one of the most controversial projects that the World Bank has approved, ever approved, and that was this uh, approval of a coal-fired coal power plant to South Africa. We will find, most likely, given that civil society, particularly in this country, is leading a campaign to reduce and keep back the funding, U.S. congressional funding, for the general capital increase Unless, unless there's a shift away from carbon, from coal-fired power plants. So it's very likely we're going to see a, a significant change in World Bank energy policy. But then you pose the question, how is the bank going to allocate and invest its $20 billion a year if it's not going to do so through large infrastructure projects? The answer is hydro. And so we're now looking, despite the fact the World Bank did not <laughs> sign on to embrace the World Commission on Dams report from the 1990s, and it is now basically looking at mega infrastructure projects, water infrastructure projects in Africa and elsewhere. So we're saying, yes, the same miscalculations, the data is there, but it's how we're presenting that information and the basis for decision making that really is faulty, particularly in this new context of climate change. So my second point about knowledge gaps is, yes, there is lack of scientific information in some cases, but again, it is how we are framing that information that I think we need greatest work on. So, for instance, in the context of climate change, what is the time frame? Our other speakers have referred to this. How will disruptions present themselves? How do we take data and integrate it into a, 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 an interpretive and explanatory system for policymakers? How do we present it in such a way that it's actionable, as Pete referred to, for policymakers to make long-term decisions? I believe, really, that we still operate on the assumption that we're operating in fixed climatic conditions, and we tend, therefore, to use incomplete data. But even worse, we're still grounded, as part of the discussion this afternoon, we'll refer to into sectoral planning that is not fully integrated. So you say, okay, 20 years ago, Colorado, uh, 90 years ago, we're not gonna repeat that mistake. Today, we are much smarter, we know what climate change is about, we know it's coming, but let me give an example of how we continue to use old contexts and methods and knowledge for, for making fundamental policy decisions about water management. And I'll take the example of the Koshi Basin, the eastern part of Nepal. I'm trying to mix domestic and international issues. This is an area where there are 20 million people that live between India, China, and the Himalayas. They, it's one of the least developed countries in the world, Nepal. It has uh, most of its uh, residents live on subs uh, subsistence agriculture. And there's very limited natural, resource, natural resources in which to develop the country, but it does have great hydroelectric capabilities. But despite the recognition of the potential impacts of climate change, investments have moved forward in making what was called simply investments in maladaptation. Most of the farmers in the area have shifted from four crops a year to two crops a year. The dry season is longer, it is drier. The reliable monsoon 
weather cycles are more sporadic. They come earlier, they come later. And as a consequence, the hydro plants and projects that were planned are no longer capable of responding to the impacts that I've just referred to. And this knowledge was available 15, 20 years ago. So what you have, in fact, are these, what we thought were environmentally friendly, run of the river, medium sized and small hydro plants that in fact are now facing the fact that they have their three to four me, uh, kilometers of dry riverbed for gr the, during the dry season. The fish have disappeared, the energy uh, availability for Kathmandu have diminished uh, oftentimes as much as six hours a day to the capital. And so we, we, th this example I'm offering again is this in this concept of how do we think ahead knowing that the changes that are coming, we don't know them. How do we build good planning in a context of uncertainty? So yes, more data, I believe that is very important, but it's really how we organize that information. We don't understand in this context, for instance, what are tipping points? What, are those, the, what happens when there's the cumulative impacts and changes reach a point where the fundamental dynamics of an ecosystem begin to break down? and are disrupted, no? Take example, the simple example, the, the, the Murray-Darling Murray River Basin on Australia. Well, we did not know how to monitor, measure. We, we did not, we had some of the data, some of the information, but it was not integrated and it was not holistic. We don't understand the vectors or the assets that need to be assessed in this context of tipping points. We don't understand exactly how, as Pete referred to, how to factor in risk, not just risk, but catastrophic risk uh, in, into this equation. Uh, we talk about 100-year floods or 50-year floods. Those 50-year floods in many parts of the world are not tw in 20-year cycles. Or the 20-year cycle of drought and, f and flood is now in seven-year cycle. And so that what you have is the inability of populations to respond, to rebuild. If it only comes once every 50 years, populations, communities can rebuild. But if it's coming every seven years, they can't. It's a quite a different phenomena and situation that we're dealing with now. So m this concept of, of uh, uh, preparing for uh, these changes in a context of the unknown is really what we are up against and the great challenge that I think, think that we are facing. I'll add two more points before I close this point, two, two, two more notes. Political economy, we do not recognize very often that in this country, 70% of water goes for agriculture and that the u energy industry and households, by and large, pay their fair share or reasonably priced for, for the water. And the, those three, those users, in fact, are the ones that are subsidizing agricultural use that is, basis, is, that is not paying for its full cost, as some of the examples from David and others pointed out. Political economy. The second point is we are not looking at the trade-offs. We do not understand that, in fact, if you want to keep having that water flowing through your spigot, it means then perhaps increased fees. It means more defensive measures being put in place by local governments, or it means changing their land use planning uh, for, for entire regions. Um, I will close that second point. The third point, recommendations. Again, I was very pleased that Alan referred to the President's Task Force on Adaptation, and I rejoined many, many of the, the framework that is offered there. I recommend it very much to your attention. Um, I, the theme of what I've said, it is not so much scientific information, but how we manage and organize that information that creates these, quote, knowledge gaps. And so my recommendations are quite pretty simple, to move from sector planning to ecosystem planning, ecosystem planning that analyzes a wider range of environmental goods and services in that, that universe, and is premised on increasing resilience, increased resilience of all these diverse factors that contribute to the integrity and the sustainability of an ecosystem. Second, that we move from static analysis to risk-based planning and analysis, particularly that we have to consider catastrophic risk um, and, and move that discussion, move that discussion of catastrophic risk and risk into the public discourse. The third point then is understanding uh, maladaptation. Th just going out there and doing something is not necessarily the best thing, as example in, in Nepal gives. We have to move from short-term responses to long-term responses that are based on uncertainty, and that is not an easy thing to do. The fourth recommendation I would make then is that um, 
we have to, essentially, in creating new knowledge, it means creating new institutions, creating the way institutions operate and think, the rationale, the logic behind decision making. And then the, f the fifth point I'd like to make is um, th it's very important for us to begin rendering and putting into the public discourse the question of trade-offs, of costs and benefits of options, and to enlarge the ownership of these trade-offs and the decisions made in, in that context. So my final point then is, uh, call it a zinger, if you will, is that, well, believe it or not, we do have an awful lot of information. Um, and most of the modelers, the people that I talk with, say to me, our information will improve, but only marginally in the next 30 years, and our models will only improve marginally in the next 30 years. So what we really have to do is we have to learn how to build programs and make decisions in this context of inadequate information. But we have to organize that information that we have in much more cogent and, and uh, actionable terms. So thank you very much. <laughs>Before I open it up, um, I want to make just a few observations uh, from the point of view of somebody who's been in the energy field probably too long. Um, the issue of water today is very, very similar in my mind to the issue of energy over the years. Uh, I got into the energy field a long time ago and I would make certain statements to the effect, you know, there's no energy shortage in the world. There's a, a lot of energy available if we want to get to it. Uh, the sun, for example, uh, puts in six million quads a year into our atmosphere. We only use 500 and some odd quads. So it's not a question of is there enough energy. It's a question of can you provide energy at a cost that people can afford. And when you get into water, as I did about 10 years ago, you suddenly realize it's exactly the same statement. We are a water-rich planet. There's no shortage of water in the world, but there is a shortage of potable water that people can afford to buy. And if you look at water issues and energy issues, they're almost identical in terms of the policy implications, and I won't go into that now, but there's one difference, one difference. There is no substitute for water. If you don't have water, you die. With energy, you can substitute one form of energy for another. That's a big difference. But other than that, if you look at the policy environment or the implications of our water issues and our energy issues, they're almost identical. And um, I just want to throw that thought out. I also want to support the point that our speakers have made, uh, all, all four speakers so far this morning, we have undervalued not only our water resources, we've under, undervalued our energy resources. I mean, we have lived through an era in this country of low energy costs. The rest of the world thinks we're absolutely crazy, but everybody likes having low cost energy. The problem is there is a price to be paid, and there is a price to be paid for undervaluing water, and we're beginning to see that price right now. Uh, with those general comments, I'd like to open it up to questions. I would ask that you, everybody use the microphone, state who you are, your affiliation, and speak up because the microphones are not turned up too much. Um, right over here. Yeah, my name's Marty Apple. Um, there's a person going to drop on You're this. going to have to speak up a little <clears> bit. <throat> I'm the Martin Apple, and I'm going to ask the following question. I think what we're doing is um, trying to solve something by going in a circle, and I'd like to try and see a way out. I like the idea of using risk management as a system because it does, for the first time, begin to pull us away from um, the things that we've gone in circles about. But here's another one, another way to look at it from game theory. And um, on each of the tables, there should be one of these little, excuse me. And essentially, it looks like this. Um, somebody says there's a crisis. And the people who are political decision makers have to determine whether or not it's true. And they don't know how. Most of the world's political decision makers are an inch deep and a mile wide in what they know. Most of the people giving them the information are just the opposite. So there's a gap there, and the gap has two elements. 
The people who are a mile deep want good policy for them. The people who are the mile wide want good science for their policy. And that's a gap they haven't bridged. And here's one of the reasons. If, there, if there's a crisis, somebody tells them there's a crisis and it's not true, and they act now, they waste their political capital. And if they waste their political capital, why should people trust them again? If they don't take action now, then they can say, phew, I was saved. I didn't waste my political capital. The third part of this game theory box is what if it is true and they acted now? Well, then they're lucky. But there's no way to really know in their own minds, because they're not deep enough, how much their actions really count. Is there a question in there somewhere? Uh, the fourth, I just want to summarize this. <laughs> Because this is the model that we, I think, should be thinking about. If there's no action, and it's true that there's a crisis, then there's big damage. But how do we convey that this action that we're asking them to take would have solved it? If we can do that, I think we're out of the conundrum. Thank you. Any comments from the uh, panel? I just want to add just one very quick point. Your, your point is well taken about the two communities uh, not overlapping enough. But I'll, t I'll say 30, starting in 1973, the, the legislative branch of the US Congress started a new program to bring scientists to work on the Hill in a fellowship program. That fellowship program is now 36 years old. Uh, the class this year is over 200 scientists coming to work on the Hill to bridge the gap that you're talking about. Now, that's not enough. I agree. But there are some attempts to bridge that gap. Uh, when that program started in 1973, there were seven fellows. Today, there's over 200. There's, there's 29 on the Hill. There's over 200. In the agencies. Right, right. Originally, it was all Hill, uh, but not, not today. Most of it's agency. Kat, do you want to get a microphone? Hi, my name is Kat Schreier. I've uh, been uh, co-director of the D.C. Area Water Issues Program, free weekly public program on various issues related to water in D.C. I've been working on water issues for, oh, a couple of decades now. And, and, uh, and one of the main issues when it comes to knowledge, water knowledge is we don't fund and we don't value communication of that knowledge to broader audiences. We are, are very much driven towards deliverables, towards uh, a study, a report, a model. Um, and once that's done, that's done. That's the end of the project. Determining how to take that information and, and re-summarize it and, and think about what the ramifications are for different targeted publics and get that information out. Um, Websites are, are fine, that, that's helpful, that's important, and people that has very quickly become part of the expectation is that someone can find something on the web. But that, that ongoing communication with the public is not nearly being funded. Um, that's, that's not where the money is. And it's very difficult to measure the, the value of just building an ongoing communication with the public, uh, uh, providing a forum that people can trust. We, we talk to the public in very limited fashion when, when it's associated with a project, if it's a scoping meeting for an environmental impact assessment, for example, where it may be suspect because it's sort of pushing a project is, is, a, is a perception. How do you, how are we ensuring that we are incorporating in the funding of water knowledge the the, uh, the development of programs, the delivery of programs, addressing some of the institutional factors. Ed mentioned uh, the, the difficulty in getting funding for multidisciplinary programs, and that's true in water communication, too. You can't talk about this because that's our program. You know, those, those kind of constraints on, on public communication on water programs. So I, I don't know how we can shift that, but there's a, a, a lot mm -hmm. more money going into very nice, neat, packaged little deliverables as opposed to developing ongoing programs associated with water, like these programs that we have Thursdays at UDC. Okay. Who would like to comment?
Okay. I do sympathize with you enormously, you know, because, you know, I find that, that we're very often stuck in that mode, you know, another report is, is the end of the story. And that should be the beginning of the story, which is frankly the reason that we thought about teaming up with Bloomberg before we even started doing anything at all. Now, that's not the same thing, thing as reaching out to the public. The public doesn't look at Bloomberg terminals. But at least it's doing justice, perhaps, to what you're arguing for, that think about the impact your knowledge gathering is supposed to be having, rather than producing knowledge for the sake of producing knowledge. And I think the water community has been guilty of that, just like any other close-knit, if not inbred, dare I say this, um, scientific community. You know, we, we've been producing water models galore. It's just that nobody cares a hoot about those. They're just gathering dust. They're too complicated, and there's no audience. There's no use for that beyond the people who produced it. So, yeah, I'm all for it. And that's why we can get it out. Yeah. Well, I can give you $10. Do you want to comment on that? Or I, I just want to add one little point. I'm sorry. I hope you heard all that. <laughs> uh, we need leadership on these issues. And if you want to get the political leadership, you've got to get their attention on elections. And it took a, much too long on the energy stuff. We have a national security issue. Energy is our biggest national security issue. And look how long it took us to get the attention of the politicians. Question. You've you got to use the microphone, please. You also need, for people to value someone taking that leadership, to talk about water and agency from DOE, to talk, you know, to invest some of their time away from some other Well, the leadership yeah. right now on energy is coming from the president. He gets it. And he's, he's not, he can't do it by himself. But if you want a statement of what our need is, listen to what the president says. We haven't had that for a long time in this country. Uh, question here. Yeah, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of uh, Emerald Planet, and I have a question. Uh, looking at, we uh, generate much data, it's a lot of information that's made available either in think tanks, institutions, and some to the public, but how can we take that and make it actionable so that the politicians, which is what this really boils down to, having the political will to bring changes and to lead within their own local communities and state, how do we take that information and then translate that into some kind of action and then policy that's uh, going to transcend all these stovepipes that we have across local jurisdictions, even across nations? Anybody want to go? Ed? Yeah, I'll take a shot at that. Um, spent a lot of time in the Pentagon, and uh, one of the things the Pentagon does extremely well is gaming. And I uh, applaud the idea of gaming with regard to, to understanding and investigating uh, what really is going on, what are the what's plausible, what's implausible. Uh, we had a, an, an initiative uh, a decade ago called Fort Future. Uh, the issue was what would what should a, a military installation look like down the road, and this had ramifications far beyond construction dollars. It had a lot of real estate uh, issues that were near and dear to the, the heart of folks that lived near the military installations, noise issues, and, and ecosystems issues, on and on and on. Uh, the way that became a success was uh, involving people from the Hill in some high-level games uh, to examine alternatives uh, not trying to predict the future. Yogi Berra proved to us that you can't do that. Uh, but but uh, looking at the range of possible futures and, and understanding how sensitive you are to those, understanding what types of actions at the policy level, because again, I think policy is broken and nothing else will get fixed until it gets fixed. Uh, and we came away from that 
with a lot of uh, insights on the Hill and a lot of support on the Hill uh, to pretty dramatically change the way the military installation community is, is managed, funded, and uh, focus on energy, net zero energy policy in place right now, uh, considers ecosystems, considers water, uh, and it considers the readiness of the military. It's a pretty good model to follow. Okay, uh, P and then David. I, I think, you know, calling for leadership is, is perhaps a too easy an answer to this, you know. It's almost always true. Um, I think, you know, it's important, first of all, to build a rationale that hangs together for audiences that matter, the business community, the security community, you know, these people are being listened to. Environment for the sake of environment, water for the sake of water, forget it. At least, you know, that's what I believe right now. I think there's one thing that made, you know, I'm from the Netherlands. This is supposed to be one of these friendly European countries. Well, we've made a lurch to the right. Climate is in the government agreement between different political parties, but only in the sense of business climate, climate for top sports. Yeah, that's there. But interestingly, water is there too. Why? Because there's an opportunity there. You know, the Dutch, you know, that the first thing is tulips, the second, uh, th second thing is probably dope. And the third thing is water. You know, we are known for water, so there's an exporting opportunity. That keeps it alive. Even though the interest goes, comes and goes, you know. There's nobody in Atlanta right now worried about water. Two years ago, they were praying for it. I think that's just a fact of life. You've got to live with that. But the opportunities, the flip side of risk, are probably more constant. And I think the business community can argue for that. Huh. David? I, I think that uh, the frequency and the intensity of water events is increasing. And I think part of what we have to do is to use those events in such a way that we're able to present a broader framework around it, that this is not, these are not isolated events, but in fact are linked to climate change. Two, I think we need to use those events to highlight the choices that we have to make as a society or just as a community on whatever level the event is taking place. And three, I think it, it becomes an opportunity then to increase the ownership of those choices. Now, that's a long-term proposition, but again, unfortunately, the, the, the frequency of these events is increasing, and it, it, it's, it's then taking those events and projecting them out and trying to capture other people who also feel threatened by those threats and those probabilities. Yeah. Do we have time for one more question? Yeah, just one, question. one more question. The microphone. Thank you. I'm Peter McCormick from the Nicholas Institute at Duke University. I, I wanted to just ask a question about, uh, you were talking about risks and so forth, and, and, and it's sort of been brought up in different ways, but in terms of trade-offs um, and the trade-offs in water resources and all the sort of dynamics we're seeing, not just the climate change, but I mean, one of the things I've, I've been sort of interested in is as, as California tightens up and this water gets transferred, whether they're imperfect markets or not, but gets transferred to the urban areas and what's happening to the agricultural sector, where's the rice production going? And uh, where, where is the food production going? And we know it was alluded to earlier that food production's needing to go up. We need to produce a lot more food in the world in the next 20 years. Unfortunately, that's not for the Goldman Sachs timeline, but it's going to happen in the next 20 years or so. Where's it gone? My assistant looked at this, and uh, Arkansas's rice production has tracked up pretty, pretty significantly. And, and but um, unfortunately, so is California's rice production. So I don't quite understand that one. But um, I then see these trade-offs in, say, what you're saying about the hydropower, in, in, in say, what's happening in, in, in the Mekong at the moment or in the Kosi. I mean, we, we've, we've basically been looking at this. We're saying no to hydropower in, in these, these parts of the world through the World Bank, through these mechanisms. And what has happened now is like in Laos, not so much in Nepal, but in, in, in Ethiopia, they've basically said, we need to do this. We need the energy. The trade-off for them is, is, so what we've seen happen now in Laos is we've just announced a large in-stream dam in the middle of the Mekong, which everyone has been trying to say this isn't a good idea, but they're saying, we don't want the World Bank involved. We don't want the. Uh, uh, we we want to go ahead and do this, but they have decided the trade-off for them in terms of food security downstream and the environment is worth doing. And I, 
there's sort of dynamics that uh, it's a very complicated question I realize but uh, just uh, your thoughts on, on, on what this trade-off really means in, 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 in what David? you're presenting. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up the Mekong. The, the fact is that it's not just one dam on the Mekong mainstream, but in fact it's 21 yeah. dams. And, and when you, st the, 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 so they've done an, a strategic environmental assessment of the one dam in Laos, but they have not done the strategic assessment for the full Mekong. And what does this mean for migra migration of fish? What does it mean for migration of people? What does it mean for a whole, s a, an enormous set of variables, water supply, variability, and so forth. So I, I, I obviously don't have an answer, but what I do know is that the framework for decision making about one dam or even two dams is inadequate. And that they have to look at what, in fact, the five dams that China is building in the Tibetan Plateau are far more significant for the entire Mekong than, at one, than five dams in, in Laos itself. So, so the, the, it's this complexity of issues that we're having to deal with, and these are transboundary issues, uh, and we have to move to that scale. I'm, I don't want to render us impotent by the magnitude of the challenge, but we just at least have to recognize that that is the framework in which we're dealing with. Pete, do you want to comment? Well, you know, what I was going to say is that um, the Yellow River obviously is all in China, so you don't have these transboundary issues. But um, interesting things that are happening down now there is that because wood scarcity, of course, is, 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 is obvious for all to see. This river basin is in deep trouble indeed. New facilities along the Yellow River now have to free up the water they're going to need from the bigger water users, which is in many cases agriculture. So what you're going to see is that with increased awareness of the risk of running dry, there's at least, you know, interesting ideas. I hope it's not all make-believe, but interesting ideas about transferring water from one sector, low value, to a higher value adding sector. And I think you can worry about food production, but this could at least, as, as the Murray Darling in Australia shows, be in some cases at least, a win-win case. You can free up water and agriculture, invest in higher efficiencies, not reduce farmer incomes, perhaps even increase them, and yet free of water. And I think that's the way to go. You know, there's 70% of the world's water is in agriculture. <coughs> that's where the solutions are going to come from. Well, that's the story about the banks. Why did uh, they were it was a Dillinger who was asked why he robs banks. He said that's because what, that's where the money is. Uh, exactly. Same thing with water. It's in agriculture. Okay. Uh, we can continue this discussion uh, either on the sidelines or at our lunchtime breakout groups, but join me in thanking our panel for an excellent job. <laughs> <laughs>